Chapter forty two of Black Oxen by Gertrude Atherton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter forty two. She was not sorry to forego the doubtful luxury of meditation on the sadness of life. When Miss Trevor's card was brought to her, she told the servant to show her up and bring tea immediately. She was not interested in Agnes Trevor, a younger sister of Polly Vane, but at all events she would talk about her settlement work and give a comfortably commonplace atmosphere to the room in which tragic clouds were rising. As it happened, Mary, during these past weeks, had seen little of New York women between the relics of her old set and their lively society-loving daughters. The women between forty and fifty, whether devoted to fashion, politics, husbands, children, or good works, had so far escaped her, and Agnes Trevor, who lived with Mrs. Vane, was practically the only representative of the intermediate age with whom she had exchanged a dozen words. But the admirable spinster had taken up the cause of the Vienna children with enthusiasm, and raised a good deal of money, besides contributing liberally herself. She was forty-two, and although she was said to have been a beautiful girl, was now merely patrician in appearance, very tall and thin and spinsterish, with a clean but faded complexion, and hair-coloured hair beginning to turn grey. She had left society in her early twenties, and devoted herself to moralising the east side. She came in with a light step, and an air of subdued bright energy, very smartly but plainly dressed in dark blue tweed, with a large black hat in which a wing had been accurately placed by the best milliner in New York. Her clothes were so well worn, and her grooming was so meticulous, her accent so clean and crisp, her manner so devoid of patronage, yet subtly remote, her controlled heart so kind that she perennially fascinated the buxom, rather sloppy, preternaturally acute, and wholly unaristocratic young ladies of the East Side. Mary, who had a dangerous habit of characterising people in her day-book, had written when she met Agnes Trevor. She radiates intelligence, goodwill, cheeriness, innate superiority, and uncompromising virginity. "'Dear Mary,' she exclaimed in her crisp, bright tones as she kissed her amiable hostess, "'how delightful to find you alone! I was afraid you would be surrounded as usual.' "'Oh, my novelty is wearing off,' said Mary dryly. "'But I will tell them to admit no one else to-day. I find I enjoy one person at a time. One gets rather tired in New York of the unfinished sentence.' "'Oh, do!' Mary's quick eye took note of a certain repressed excitement in the fine eyes of her guest, who had taken an upright chair. Lounging did not accord with that spare, ascetic figure. "'And you are quite right. It is seldom one has anything like real conversation. One has to go for that to those of our older women who have given up society to cultivate the intellects God gave them.' "'Are there any?' murmured Mary. "'Oh, my dear, yes. But of course you've had no time to meet them in your mad whirl. Now that things have slowed down a bit, you must meet them.' "'I'm afraid it's too late. I sail in a fortnight.' "'Oh!' Miss Trevor's voice shook oddly, and the slow colour crept up her cheeks. But at that moment the tea was brought in. "'Will you pour it out?' said Mary. "'I'm feeling rather lazy.' "'Of course!' Miss Trevor was highly acquiescent. She seated herself before the table. The man retired with instructions that Madame was not at home to other callers. Mary watched her closely as she stirred the tea with a little business-like air, warmed the cups, distributed the lemon, and then poured out the clear brown fluid. "'Formosa Oolong,' she said, sniffing daintily. "'The only tea!' I hate people who drink scented teas, don't you? I'm going to have a very strong cup, so I'll wait a minute or two. I'm rather tired. You? You look as if you never relaxed in your sleep. How do you keep it up? Oh, think of the life the younger women lead, 
mine is a quiet amble along a country road by comparison but monotonous the last word came out with the effect of a tiny explosion it evidently surprised miss trevor herself for she frowned poured out a cup of tea that was almost black and began sipping it with a somewhat elaborate concentration for one so simple and direct of method i'm afraid good works are apt to grow monotonous a sad commentary on the triumphs of civilization over undiluted nature mary continued to watch the torch-bearer of the east side don't you sometimes hate it she asked the question idly interested for the moment in probing under another shell hardened in the mould of time and half hoping that agnes would be natural and human for once cease to be the bright well-oiled machine she was by no means prepared for what she got miss trevor gulped down the scalding tea in an almost unladylike manner and put down the cup with a shaking hand that's what i've come to see you about she said in a low intense voice and her teeth set for a moment as if she had taken a bit between them mary you've upset my life i what next i suppose you have troubles of your own dear and i hate to bother you with mine oh mine amount to nothing at present and if i can help you she felt no enthusiasm at the prospect but she saw that the woman was labouring under excitement of some sort and if she could not give her sympathy at least she might help her with sound practical advice moreover she was in for it better tell me all about it it is terribly hard i'm so humiliated and i suppose no more reticent woman ever lived oh reticence why not emulate the younger generation i'm not sure although i prefer the happy medium myself that they are not wiser than their grandmothers and their maiden aunts on the principle that confession is good for the soul i don't believe that women will be so obsessed by well let us say sex in the future miss trevor flushed darkly it is possible that's what i am a maiden aunt just that and nothing more nothing more i thought you were accounted one of the most useful women in serious new york a sort of mother to the east side mother how could i be a mother i'm only a maiden aunt even down there not that i want to be a mother i was going to ask you why you did not marry even now it is not too late to have children of your own oh yes it is that's all over or nearly but i can't say that i ever did long for children of my own although i get on beautifully with them well asked mary patiently what is it that you want a husband this time there was no doubt about the explosion mary felt a faint sensation of distaste and wondered if she were reverting to type as a result of this recent association with the generation that still clung to the distastes and the disclaimers of the nineteenth century why didn't you marry when you were a girl i am told that you were quite lovely i hated the thought i was in love twice but i had a sort of cold purity that i was proud of the bare idea of of that nauseated me pity you hadn't done some settlement work first that must have knocked prudishness out of you i should think it horrified me so that for several years i hardly could get on with it and i have always refused to mix the sexes in my house down there but of course i could not help hearing things seeing things and after a while i did get hardened and ceased to be revolted i learned to look upon all of that sort of thing as a matter of course but it was too late then i had lost what little looks i had ever possessed i grew to look like an old maid long before i was thirty why is nature so cruel mary i fancy a good many american women developed very slowly sexually you were merely one of them i wonder you had the climacteric so early but nature is very fond of taking her little revenges you defied her and she smote you oh yes she smote me but i never fully realized it until you came i hardly follow you oh don't you see 
you have shown us that women can begin life over again undo their awful mistakes and yet i don't dare don't dare why not pray better come with me to vienna if you haven't the courage to face the music here oh i haven't the courage i couldn't carry things off with such a high hand as you do you were always high and mighty they say and have done as you please all your life you don't care a pin whether we approve of what you've done or not it's the way you're made but i couldn't stand it the admission of vanity after the life i've led the young women would say in their nasty slang that i was probably man crazy and aren't you asked mary coolly isn't that just what is the matter the sex imagination often outlived the withering of the sex glands come now admit it forget that you are a pastel tinted remnant of the old order and call a spade a spade there's something terrifying about you mary miss trevor had flushed a dark purple but she had very honest eyes and they did not falter but i respect you more than any woman i have ever known and although you are not very sympathetic you are the only person on earth to whom i could even mention such a subject well go ahead said mary resignedly if you want my advice take your courage in your hands and do it however people may carp there is nothing they so much admire as courage yes but they make you suffer tortures just because they do admire it or to keep themselves from admitting it true enough but after all they don't matter life would be so much simpler if we'd all make up our minds that what other people think about us does not signify in the least it's only permitting it to signify that permits it to exist that's all very well for you but it's really a question of temperament do you think i dare come back here looking like a girl again and i suppose i should i'm sixteen years younger than you you must know how many of the women hate you that sort of hate may be very stimulating my dear agnes said madame said madame zattiany dryly i can understand that but i should return to what it is hardly an exaggeration to call a life of a thousand intimacies the ridicule the contempt the merciless criticism i don't want to live anywhere else i can't face it but oh i do so want it i do so want it but just think of the compensations no doubt you would marry immediately if you were happy and with a man to protect you how much would you care oh once more the thin ascetic face was dyed with an unbecoming flush oh and then the barriers fell with a crash and she hurried on the words tumbling over one another as her memory its inhibitions shattered swept back into the dark vortex of her secret past oh mary you don't know you don't know you who've had all the men you ever wanted who they say have a young man now the nights of horror i've passed i've never slept a wink the nights our girls married i could have killed them i could have killed every man i've met for asking nothing of me it seems to me that i've thought of nothing else for twenty years when i've been teaching counselling good thoughts virtue good conduct to those girls down there it's been in the background of my mind every minute like a terrible obsession i wonder i haven't gone mad some of us old maids do go mad and no one knew until they raved what was the matter with them when hannah de lacy lost her mind three years ago i heard one of the doctors telling peter vane that her talk was the most libidinous he had ever listened to and she was the most forbidding old maid in new york i know if i lose my mind it will be the same and that alone is enough to drive any decent woman mad i thought i'd get over it in time i used to pray and fight with my will but when the time came when i should have been released i was afraid i would and then i deliberately did everything i could to keep it alive i couldn't lose my right it was my right i couldn't tell you all the things i've oh i tell you that unless i can be young again and have some man any man i don't care whether he'll marry me or not i'll go mad mad 
her voice had risen to a shriek she would be in hysterics in another moment mary who was on the point of nausea went hastily into her dressing-room and poured out a dose of sal volatile here she said peremptorily drink this i'll not listen to another word and i don't wish to be obliged to call an ambulance miss trevor gulped it down and then permitted herself to be led to a sofa where she lay sprawled her immaculate hat on one side giving her the look of a debauched gerontic virgin she lay panting for a few moments while madame zattiany paced up and down the room she turned as she heard a groan miss trevor was sitting up straightening her hat feel better she asked unsympathetically oh yes my nerves feel better but what have i said what must you think of me i never expected to give way like that when i came i thought i could put it all to you in a few delicate hints knowing that you would understand what have i said i can hardly remember better not try i'll promise to forget it myself she sat down beside the sofa now listen to me it would not be wise for you to go to vienna they would suspect if not at once then certainly when you returned it can be done here the rejuvenescence is so gradual that it would hardly be noticed fully a year you do not have to go into a hospital nor even to bed you are not spied on so no one would suspect that you were taking the treatment at your age success is practically assured take it and don't be a fool if you don't it's only a question of time when that superb self-control you have practised for so many years will go again and too possibly in the wrong place it is quite likely that you will never be suspected because women often bloom out in their forties take on a new lease of life begin to put on a little make-up miss trevor interrupted with a horrible exclamation it would be judicious if they criticise you remember that nothing they can say will be as bad from your point of view as their finding out the truth they will lay it to that and to the fact that you have grown a little stouter and let me tell you you won't care in the least even if conservatism attacks you in solid battalions for your mental attitude to life will be entirely changed remember that you will be young again and too gay and happy to mind what people think of you now promise me that you will take my advice and then go home and to bed miss trevor got up and went to the mirror yes i'll do it and then she said no doubt for the first time in her life and i'll not give a damn no matter what happens when she had left mary zattiany stood for a few moments striking her hands together her face distorted a wave of nausea overwhelmed her she felt as if there had been an earthquake in her own soul and its muck were riding the surface she loathed herself and all women and all men she knew that the violence of the revulsion must be temporary but for the moment it was beyond her control she went to the telephone and called up clavering and told him that she had a severe headache and was going to bed and she cut short both his protests and his expression of sympathy by hanging up the receiver and then she picked up a vase and hurled it on the floor and smashed it End of chapter forty two